All right, welcome back to Debrick. It's now 25 minutes to 7 o'clock, and it's time to speak to Na Kenya Party leader Martha Karua. Good morning, Honorable. And it's been quite a bit of time, more than three months since we last spoke on this show. How have you been keeping, of course, seeing a lot of uh, developments, both uh, in the COVID 19 situation, but also in the political world? What have you been up to? Morning, Sam. Everything has been well. Just uh, trying to cope with uh, the situation, just like every other Kenyan, and to adopt to the new normal. Right, great. And uh, of course, uh, during that time, so much has uh, uh, passed. And uh, le the latest, we're talking about the Public Order Act that uh, was uh, uh, invoked by the National Security Advisory Committee last week, indicating that um, uh, public meetings or conveners of public gatherings will be required to notify the police between 3 and 14 days to the event. But also, the police now appear to, have the li to be at liberty to uh, cancel or stop such meetings should they, should they think that uh, there's risk of violence. How have you been receiving this? Because you're also a, a politician that may want to hold such kind of meetings in the coming days. I think one of the things we must tell the police and the Uhuru administration is that no cabinet subcommittee, technical committee, or security committee can amend the constitution through declarations. The Public Order Act has been in place for as long as I can remember, and the provisions are very clear. Politicians do not need permission to hold meetings. They merely notify the police. And the reason for notifying the police, and I'm saying that with authority, being one of the people who amended the Public Order Act during the IPPG to remove the requirement of permits for meeting. The notification is to ensure, one, that the police are aware, two, that two competing parties do not go to the same venue at the same time. The reason of notifying the police is so that they mind law and order during the meeting. The police cannot sit idle, tell Kenyans that there is a threat of peace and fail to manage it in order to stop legitimate political activity. And what I'm seeing is that uh, the, there is double standards in the application of the law, where the police are facilitating meetings by those aligned to the president and his BBI partner, while disrupting those that perceived to be against that BBI arrangement. And this is not tenable. Mm -hmm. The constitution is very clear. The law must be applied equally to all. And the police must refuse to be used as a partisan tool by one side of the government. Mm -hmm. But Honorable Karua, so looking at the Public Order Act, uh, it appears that uh, in instances where the police have reason to believe there is risk of violence, they can stop it. Is this unconstitutional? And what do you think needs to be done to remedy it? Or is it just being misused by the police? It is abuse of the law. In a proper situation, they can. But when you look at the scenario and what is happening, that they claim there is a threat of peace, I think it's double standards and it's abuse of the law and it's totally unconstitutional insofar as it is discriminatory mm -hmm. and unwarranted. Mm -hmm. and, and last week yeah. we heard uh, from the cabinet office, I believe it was on Thursday after the cabinet meeting, and we saw something like a unanimous decision to adopt the guidelines as issued uh, by the National Security Advisory Committee. Has that ever happened? And why would we be even hearing of communication saying unanimous decision of the cabinet? <laughs> like they ever tell us when there is dissent. We are given what is the decision of the cabinet. And that's where I'm saying whether it's the National uh, Security Advisory Committee, whether it's the cabinet, a resolution of the cabinet cannot amend the law. So it, it amounts to nothing if the directive is being used in an unconstitutional manner 
And it looks like um, clearly it is intended to favor one side against the other. Mm -hmm. If you look at the history of uh, the rec our recent history, this matter started with the popularization of BBI after the first report was issued, where we had a pro-BBI rally at Bukungu Stadium and another one announced by those against it at Mumias. And the Mumias rally was disrupted with tear gas and brutality mm -hmm. while the Bukungu rally went on. From there on, we have been seeing either uh, people who are perceived to be against BBI being ejected out of meetings. We have seen disrupt, uh, disruptions of members of parliament, even in their constituencies, who are allied to a side seen not to favor BBI. Mm -hmm. We have seen um, leaders like uh, Musalia and Wetangula being disrupted in Western Kenya and other MPs when pro government pro-BBI uh, people like uh, Oparanya and CS Eugene Wamalwa were able to continue with their rallies. Mm -hmm. And this time we were being told they have flouted the COVID rules. Mm -hmm. And then we have seen recently the functions of the former prime minister, Raila Odinga, able to go on while those of the deputy president are not going on. And I've been saying, we can very well say this is the arrangement. But the truth of the matter is that when they finish with each other, they're going to visit us with the same skewed application of the law. We do not need double standards. The Constitution does not allow it because it is discriminatory. This is abuse of power right. and abuse of um, clear provisions of the law by this administration, and shall I say the Uhuru administration. Okay, so w what should they do? We see the law society of Kenya has gone to court. So the political class, should they just defy and disobey these guidelines? Or uh, what, what more can they do in a peaceful manner? I think people, we really cannot accept that the law and the law enforcement agencies will be used to prevent legitimate political activity. We must continue as before and within the law to hold our political activities, notify the police, and if it becomes quite clear that they are stopping, they, they are illegally stopping, mm -hmm. it is even necessary to actually sue Hilary Mutiambai by name, Mm -hmm. and the officers that he will send. Because if it is clear that it is not in the interest of security, they are just facilitating one political narrative as against the other, mm -hmm. then it must be resisted. <clears throat> we did not <clears throat> clamor for the, new, uh, for the current constitution we have, a 20-year journey to see it watered down and disrespected by this administration. This we must resist. We are not going back to those days of one party rule, of skewed application of the law. This is the Kanu playbook being repeated once again. But, but Honorable Okaroa, when you look at um, the background, the justification that was given by the National Security Advisory Committee, as well as from the cabinet resolutions of Thursday last week, they say that already we can see what would appear to be a drum, drum beats for war and uh, a, pre, a situation similar to what happened before the 2007 post-election uh, post violence. Are you convinced we are at such a bad situation? And what do you think we need to do to remedy the situation with a constitution that is 10 years down the line? We are at a bad place because this administration has deliberately precipitated this situation. If you remember the Kanu playbook, President Moy would say that multi-party will bring discord in the country. And then Kanu would hire goons to disrupt opposition meetings to fulfill that prophecy. That's exactly what is happening today. The recent incident in Moranga, if we are to take that one, the police say that they had information that there are where people were transported.
This is a country that has the NIS. Therefore, they must be ahead of their game. If they know people are planning to transport people for illegal activities, they have the means to stop it. They have the means to arrest the situation and not happily wait for chaos to erupt, two people to die, and then to tell us that, oh, these are the people who planned. Why didn't you stop it? That is why police are notified. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it was one faction of government against the other faction. How long is the government going to encourage lawlessness using and then use the police as a tool to stop legitimate activity by one side? Mm -hmm. Police are not supposed to help any one side in their campaigns. They are supposed to manage security, apply the law without fear or favor. Mm -hmm. uh, when a government deliberately violates the constitution, deliberately violates the law, this could amount to gross violation of the constitution, and it may very well amount to an impeachable offense. Right, and Honorable Karua, of course, uh, that event in Moranga is yet to be resolved. We heard that um, there's some two MPs who had been summoned by the Inspector General to go and record statements. We don't have any evidence to show that that has already happened. But the investigations have been uh, slow uh, coming. When you look at that, I mean, it's 21 months to the next election. What must we brace ourselves for if really we were to go through this process and get to the election of 2022? If the admi Uhuru administration continues to apply the law in a skewed manner, they are actually forcing Kenya into civil strife, which is most unfortunate. Their mandate is to manage this country properly, to apply the law equally, and the mandate of the police and of every state agency is to op operate within the constitution and the law. When they investigate incidents, whether Moranga or otherwise, they are supposed to look at it wholly, not cover up for one side while heaping blame on one side. We want to see investigations that are above board for all those incidents. Mm -hmm. And we remember when there was a scaffold in a church in Moranga between two sides of the same government and action was taken on one side. We are urging the IG to be faithful to his oath of office. Otherwise, he will be individually, together with the officers he sends, liable for abusing the law. We are also telling the government, the Uhuru administration, that they will be liable. And the buck stops with the president. He has to see that the law is applied equally without fear or favor. It is not enough to hold national prayers. It is not enough to ask for forgiveness when they are deliberately causing strife under the guise of building bridges while breaking existing bridges. Mm -hmm. We urge the president to show st uh, statesmanship by embracing all Kenyans, even those who do not support him and ensuring that they enjoy equal benefit and equal protection of the law. Okay. Uh, that is his mandate. Anything less than that amounts to a gross violation of the Constitution and abuse of powers bestowed upon him as a trust by Kenyans. And Honorable Karua, of course, um, this is happening within a situation where you've seen the divide, not just at the uh, apex leadership of this country, but also within the Jubilee Party. Recently, we saw a statement from the Secretary General saying that uh, there, was, uh, there were plans to make sure that um, the Deputy President ceases being the Deputy Party leader of Jubilee. I know you were in the Kibaki government the first and second time, and there was some s similar conflict between um, then President and then minister for was it roads Ray Dinga. but when you look at what you're witnessing now i mean what should we be reading uh, is, it, is it true that these are competing interests because one wants to go and run a campaign or is it some personal dif uh, some personal differences that have really split the ruling party 
and the administration. Let me say that what happens in Jubilee ought not to be the concern of other political parties. It only becomes our concern if state power is used to resolve issues or to oppress those who do not agree with those in power. And I think that there is a very thin line separating party and state when the party, a party is in power. And it is up to the top leadership of the country to ensure that they do not bring their chaos to the nation. And the law is very clear. So what the Jubilee party does with one another within their party ought not really to be a, con a concern or extended to mm -hmm. the nation. They can use the registrar of political parties to resolve their disputes or their party machinery and their constitutions. And the country must be run in strict compliance with the constitution. The duty to ensure that is done squarely is with President Uhuru Kenyatta. This is a wake up call to the president. Rise up to your duties. Adhere to your oath of office that you must ensure State power is not used to oppress anyone, even those who do not agree with you. You must ensure equal benefit, equal protection of the law of every Kenyan. You are the president of Kenya, not of a faction, not of friends. You are the president of the Republic of Kenya. This is the duty you must discharge. And you must not let chaos and anarchy under your watch in the guise of facilitating mm -hmm. one side of the political divide to gain advantage. And we have seen these bad manners spreading across other states. We can see what is happening in Tanzania, where the Electoral Commission is uh, stopping the campaigns of the opposition to give advantage to the ruling party. If this is the playbook that is beginning here, the message to the government is that we as Kenyans will resist. But, but, hon the hon constitution right. allows us to do it. Hon hon Karua, yeah. what yeah. should the deputy president do? Because there appears to be uh, total disrespect, both for, uh, from some of the cabinet uh, secretaries, but also within the party. Yet he's the deputy president who feels sidelined. What options does he have? I want to talk not about the deputy president alone, but about the presidency. Our constitution gives mandate to the president and to the presidency. And the president cannot run as president of Kenya without a running mate. So Kenyans gave him that office knowing who his deputy is. Very same the way it is done with governors. So the occupier of the office of president must at all times be conscious that his mandate is together with his deputy. And if he feels that they no longer can work together, the government can resign and we will elect another president with his deputy. They are joined at the hip. Therefore, calls for one to go and not the other, I think that's again a skewed application of the law. So for the duration of their term, they must suffer each other. And it is possible perfectly mm -hmm. to work with people you don't ordinarily agree with because the office is not personal space. It's a public space. So my question to our president with the greatest respect. What precedent are you setting of how a president should treat a deputy? What examples are you giving to the governors on how to treat their deputies? We already had incidences where the, some governors are using their powers to oppress their deputy. Are you now putting a stamp on such a practice? Moving forward, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. We need to see that the holder of the office of president treats his deputy with decorum. And if there are disagreements, they should be in their boardroom, not out in the public. And if the situation becomes untenable, then they can vacate and let other people carry on. But we cannot have state power being used mm -hmm. to settle personal scores. Right, and Honorable Karwa, I want us to start winding up with the conversation around the dissolution of parliament because the Chief Justice is yet to yeah. comprise a, a, a three-judge bench or at least a three-judge bench uh, from the information that we have. But what is your standing? Because the Law Society of Kenya, the, the society that you also belong to, I, I believe so, um, has gone to court and uh, wants, uh, or rather says that you cannot go to court to challenge the decision or the advisory of the Chief Justice. They were at Parliament yesterday saying that um, a Parliament after the 12th of October is no longer constitutional and it is an illegal uh, composition. What are your thoughts about this? From where I stand, the courts have given us their best. When Justice, Chief Justice gave his advisory to the president, the matter now squarely lies with the president. And although someone has gone to court, that is a sly way of trying to extend the matter and trying to buy time for the president. I think that the president must do what is right. It is his people who have gone to court. What part of the advisory doesn't he understand? What part of the constitution doesn't he understand that they want the court to interpret? They're just buying time. But the matter being in court, I have not followed it. But I expect if a judge has said that a three bench judge, uh, a three bench, uh, a three, three judge, judge bench, bench is mm -hmm. required, let the judiciary resolve that so that we may go forward and let that bench be set out so that the matter may, may be concluded. This parliament has run its term now that the advisory was given. And we should not continue with an illegitimate parliament. This is the impunity that has been playing in Kenya, where people abuse the court process to prolong matters that are clear as daylight. I do hope that this matter, the way will be opened, and it can be opened by the president asking his people to withdraw the suit before the court. So let us not talk as though it is the Chief Justice who is delaying the matter. Okay. It is the state. The same way they slyly went to court to seek an advisory not to implement the two-thirds gender rule in 2012. It's the same way they have again slyly gone back to court. But, they but can withdraw Honorable that Karua, matter Honorable and Karua. let the president mm -hmm. do what is right. Yes. There, there are those that argue that this advisory is timeless. That it doesn't specify when it has to be uh, It is quite clear when that uh, the courts have ruled where no time is given, reasonable time is within 14 days. Even when it's timeless, the president can also, uh, also act reasonably. It is his dilemma. Mm -hmm. This is a political problem. Let them not wait for the court to solve a political problem. They could have solved this matter they had have, they've had a two-year run, almost three years from mm -hmm. 2015, actually five years from 2015. Right. They knew that the constitution will reach its limit. It did. Let us do the right thing. Okay. They can withdraw that suit. And the attorney general knows very well that this is a sly way to buy time. All right. Honorable Patha Karua, we may never get enough time to talk about uh, State of the Nation on this show, but uh, thank you so much for your time and uh, for agreeing to speak to us on Daybreak. We'll do this again some of the time uh, when it allows. Um, of course, uh, Honorable Matha Karua is the party leader of the NAC Kenya party, but she tells me that I have to insist that she's a future presidential candidate. I hope that's uh, still the case. Uh, but uh, up next is uh, Willis Raburu. He'll be here with um, a Comedy Tuesday. We'll wait for him.